A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. Azariah stood up in the fire and prayed aloud, For your name's sake, O Lord, do not deliver us up forever, or make void your covenant. Do not take away your mercy from us, for the sake of Abraham, your beloved, Isaac, your servant, and Israel, your holy one, to whom you promised to multiply their offspring like the stars of heaven or the sand on the shore of the sea. For we are reduced, O Lord, beyond any other nation, brought low everywhere in the world this day because of our sins. We have in our day no prince, prophet, or leader, no burnt offering, sacrifice, oblation, or incense, no place to offer first fruits to find favor with you. But with contrite heart and humble spirit, let us be received, as though it were burnt offerings of rams and bullocks or thousands of fat lambs. So let our sacrifice be in your presence today as we follow you unreservedly. For those who trust in you cannot be put to shame. And now we follow you with our whole heart. We fear you and we pray to you. Do not let us be put to shame, but deal with us in your kindness and great mercy. Deliver us by your wonders and bring glory to your name, O Lord. Verbum Domini. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. Remember your mercies, O Lord. Remember that your compassion, O Lord, and your kindness are from of old. In your kindness, remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice. He teaches the humble his way. says the Lord, return to me with your whole heart, for I am gracious and merciful. Sancti Evangelii secundum Matteo. Gloria ti mi Domine. Peter approached Jesus and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but seventy-seven times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property in payment of the debt. 
At that the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, Pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had, put him in, he had him put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you, unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. Verbum Domini Laus Divi Christe I think we can love Peter, St. Peter, in this passage because he asks a very human question, a question that ultimately each one of us probably, unless he asked it, we would have liked to know. How many times do I really have to forgive? Um, you know, is there some circumstance where maybe I don't? And Jesus basically says to him, no, there isn't any circumstance. You have to forgive every time. That's ultimately what the Lord is saying to him. And if, if we're really honest with ourselves, sometimes it feels good to hate. It doesn't get us anywhere. It's just like any other sin. Sin in the moment feels good right now and we're miserable later. And it's the same thing with unforgiveness, that sometimes it's just difficult because we, we don't want to. And there is something in us that wants to hold on to this and maybe build it up bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, almost bigger than life. And the Lord is saying, you got to let that go. And we ultimately know when we do forgive from our heart, the peace that comes and the joy that enters back into our life. Uh, but again, compared to any other struggle uh, that we have with another sin, uh, that it's not always the easiest thing to do. And really, the Lord's asking us to go deep unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. So it's not just in my mind, but really from my heart, the Lord uh, is asking me from the very core of who you are, I want you to forgive your brother uh, because this is what I do to you. That's ultimately what the parable is telling us. Just the way the Lord dealt with you, your big, huge debt, he's forgiven it. And then you hold this little debt over everybody else's head and get over it, you know. Again, it, it, it's, it's difficult, and this is why we pray the Our Father so frequently throughout the day. In that prayer, what do we say? Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our sins the way that we forgive the debt and the trespass that has been committed against us. Liturgically, we are invited to pray the Lord's Prayer three times during the day. We pray the Our Father at the Mass, and we pray the Our Father at morning prayer and at evening prayer. You know, so important is this prayer, this way that Jesus taught us to pray, 
that the church does this, invites us to pray this way liturgically three times throughout the day. And then piously or in devotion, don't we pray the Our Father more often? You know, if we pray five decades of the rosary, we're saying the Our Father six times. Do we mean what we say? Ultimately, we're begging the Lord for the ability. That's what we're, when we say that, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Many times what we're thinking is, Lord, you know, help me to do exactly what you've done for me. Because we recognize how difficult uh, this truly is. Um, so to forgive our brother from our heart. In the first reading from the book of the prophet Daniel, they're lamenting Azariah standing there, uh, stood up in the fire and prayed aloud. So you're there in persecution, uh, being put to death. But he's saying to the Lord, we have no ability to go to the temple and offer this sacrifice. Um, we don't have an ability to offer this Holocaust. Uh, but the Holocaust that will give you, the burnt offering or the sacrifice, the oblation that will give, is a contrite heart and a humble spirit. And so we will be truly repentant uh, in our heart, truly sorry for our sin. And ultimately, that's what we're asking the Lord then for. Forgive us. Forgive us all of my debt. Forgive us all of my sin, because what I'll offer you instead is this contrite heart and humble spirit, as though it were burnt offerings of rams and bullocks or thousands of fat lambs. So let our sacrifice be in your presence today as we follow you unreservedly, for those who trust in you cannot be put to shame. And now we follow you with our whole heart. We fear you and we pray to you. It's a beautiful prayer for us to pray uh, on this uh, day in the third week of Lent, to take the words of Scripture and make it our own. Lord, so my offering is going to, I'm not going to be able to, you know, I'm not going to cut apart this animal and put it on this altar and offer this holocaust to you. I'm going to tear open my heart, and this is what I'm going to offer you. Um, with true contrition and humility, a humble spirit. And um, remember, you know, what contrition is. It, it's not guilt. We're not looking, I say this often to you, we're not looking to constantly be stirring up guilt. That's what Catholics are accused of, but that's very mistaken. Oh, yes, I must be guilty and guilty and guilt. Guilt gets us to repent, and that's the point. Guilt is good enough to get us to say, Lord, I am sorry for my sin, and to get it off of us. What's between you and me? Let's get it out of the way. I shared that with you last week. Contrition is this growing in us. We have contrition when we come and repent of our sins, but we want to grow uh, in our sorrow for our sin. As we mature in our faith, we continue to uh, experience at a deeper level the uh, mercy of God, ultimately the love of God for us. And what we so often feel in our heart when we have this little glimpse, and they, it comes in little glimpses, how deeply the Lord truly loves me, and have this inner feeling of uh, uh, we're overwhelmed in that moment. And what do we feel inside of us but this tremendous unworthiness of that love? And we're very acutely aware of the Lord loves me so deeply, and yet I can't believe what, how I repaid that love. I can't believe how I've lived my life. Now, again, these are things that we've already asked the Lord pardon for. But we go to him again and again throughout our life and have these moments where we might shed tears or that we ask him again. We just say, Lord, I am so sorry 
for how I've just rejected your love or been flippant in my relationship with you. I, again, a, a keener awareness that we have. Uh, as I've shared before, it's the difference of uh, the teenager who um, you know, makes a, a disaster, causes heartache for his mother and father. And in order to make sure they don't kill him, that he says, I'm sorry. And they say, okay, they do what they're supposed to, you're forgiven. But as he gets older and matures, he may revisit that moment and say, you know, I really am sorry for what I did 10 years ago. I really am sorry. Now, if he keeps doing that over and over when he's 30, 40, 50, and 60, his parents will in the right way say, you got to get over this. But when it comes down the pike once or twice where he says, I really, this really, I really, I know how deeply I hurt you. His parents love him more intensely because they see someone who has matured and grown and really owns that and really knows what that offense was. It's not even the thing that was done. It's I've offended the love of my mother and father for me. And that's what wounds me. That's what I recognize this hurt in my heart that the, how could I have been so stupid as to have done this? And that's what we then turn to our parent and say, I really, from my heart, I'm sorry for this. This is what happens to the believer as we grow in our relationship with the Lord, as we mature in our faith, that we say often to the Lord, and as I said, sometimes with the shedding of tears, that we say, how could have I done this? And you can't say, the devil made me do it. You know, when we're really mature, we say, yes, I did that. And we're really turning to the Lord and saying, I am sorry for offending your love for me. And so we want to grow in contrition. You know, um, imperfect contrition is the fear of going to hell, the fear of losing heaven. That's what we say in the act of contrition. I'm afraid of the fires of hell and, um, you know, losing eternal life. But perfect contrition is because I have offended you, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. And that's what we're trying, each of us is trying to attain. That I recognize I've offended a God who is love and who is deserving of my love and to the full dedication of my heart and my life. Um, and this is the type of contrition we want to have. So how do we stir that up? And one of the ways that we do that during this season of Lent, especially, is to meditate on the passion of Christ, this manifestation of God's love for us. Um, and so we say, well, you know, we encourage people, look upon the crucifix. You know, just if you need some way to pray, look upon Jesus crucified. But what do we do so often in our churches? We invite you to come to the Stations of the Cross every Friday. And yes, for those of you unaware, we do have the Stations here every Friday after benediction at about 520. And you're welcome to be here. We encourage you, come and pray the Stations with us. Um, but in most every church, and I think I commend a lot of the pastors who add this in, you know, come pray the Stations of the Cross and afterward we'll have a meatless, simple meal in the parish hall, you know, a bowl of soup. So I invite you for a little fellowship. And, but what do they say first? Come to the Stations. Come meditate on the Passion of Christ. Um, even individually as you walk this way, uh, to Calvary with the Lord. This stirs up contrition. If we need uh, an aid to do what we were commanded to do in the gospel, that we forgive my brother, I forgive my brother from my heart, if I walk the stations of the cross with sincerity during this season of Lent, 
at least a few times, I'm reminded of what Christ did for me. And along that way, we have a conviction in our heart to say, if he can do this for love of me, then I can do what he's commanded me to do. Then I can forgive from my heart. Um, I can uh, experience, I can make an effort for conversion in my life. Uh, when you pray the Stations of the Cross, I would just encourage you, remember Christ did this for you. He didn't do it for a herd. He did it for an individual. And to enter, when you gaze upon the crucifix or when you walk the stations, to have very a conscious awareness, Jesus did this for me. And that's the reality. You know, love doesn't have in mind a whole crowd of people. Love has in mind a person. And so to really take that to heart, think of this, that Jesus dying upon the cross was thinking of me, Yes, he was thinking of you. He was thinking of me. And not with this attitude of wait till I get a hold of him, but out of love for me, he died. You know, this is, everyone can profess their love, you know, in one way or another, but no one really is going to go to the point of dying for us. You know, there's only a couple people in our life who will do it. I'd like to believe that all of you love me so much that if all of a sudden somebody walked in that back door and posed danger to me, all of you would immediately stand up and say, you got to come through me before you get to him. Well, what's the reality in that moment? Duck! You know, <laughs> boom, everybody runs out to St. Michael's Hall, <laughs> and I'm standing here. You know, it's like, okay, you know, the servers, they'll get up and defend me, you know? Um, but who dies for us? My mom or my dad? They, they give their life for the children and the spouse. And this is the beauty of uh, a man kneeling down on his knee when he professes his love for his sweetheart. He's saying, I'm going to live my whole life for you, baby. And ultimately, <laughs> he's telling her, I'll die for you. This is how much I love you. This is the beauty, uh, you know, we see this in these human manifestations, but Jesus meant it wholeheartedly, and he did it. And that's what he says. I love you so much. This is God. I love you so much. I'll die for you. In fact, I did die for you. Um, I just want to give a little plug for the Franciscans uh, and the Way of the Cross. The website Alatea. Uh, posted this just last week saying, next time you see a Franciscan, be sure to thank him for bringing us the Stations of the Cross. I'll just assume that you're grateful. <laughs> um, but tradition tells us that Our Lady, we know, we know from the scripture that our, our Blessed Mother accompanied Jesus on his way of the cross, that he was, she was there and gave him strength as she walked with him on his way of suffering. And that's what you see in most of the stations. Our Lady, if she's not next to our Lord, she's definitely within eyeshot. But tradition says that Our Lady, after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension, would walk these way, this way of the cross and remember um, the manifestation of Christ's love for us and that she stopped along the way to pray and to meditate before she went with John, St. John to Ephesus. And so people want, wanted to imitate our Blessed Mother. And by the reign of the Emperor Constantine, there were various little chapels, and you see this in the Holy Land in Jerusalem, little chapels or little markers were set up at these points where Christ uh, went through his passion or on, was walking on his way to Calvary carrying the cross. And so pilgrims would make this heroic uh, journey to the Holy Land 
to visit the holy sites. And one of the things that they did is they would walk this way to Calvary and they'd always want to bring a little piece of rock or stone back to remember this. And over time, travel to the Holy Land was already difficult, but at times it wasn't permitted. And so in lieu of traveling to these holy sites, Franciscans and others uh, in Europe decided they would create little shrines where people could go and uh, meditate upon Christ's passion. Some of them so, so specific that they tried to uh, put these little spots as far apart as the paces were in the Holy Land. So this is this many steps, so then we're going to take that many steps so they could imitate this walk of Christ. Um, in 1342, the Franciscans were appointed special guardians of the holy sites in the Holy Land. And it was around this time that we first see the mention of the word stations to denote these spots, these places along the way of Jesus' passion. And it was in the 17th century that the Franciscans wanted to begin erecting these stations within the church walls, and they asked the Holy Father for permission. And this is classic of Franciscans. They also wanted the faithful to be granted the same indulgences that would be given to those who travel to Jerusalem. That you receive that same grace. And so I'm just going to read this from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Um, this is what we're told. Realizing that few persons were able to gain these indulgences by means of a personal pilgrimage to the Holy Land, Pope Innocent XI in 1686 granted to the Franciscan family the right to erect the stations in all of their churches and declared that all the indulgences that had ever been given for devoutly visiting the actual scenes of Christ's passion could thenceforth be gained by Franciscans and any others affiliated with their order if they made the way of the cross in their own churches in the accustomed manner. Pope Innocent XII confirmed the privilege in 1694, and Pope Benedict XIII in 1726 extended it to all the faithful. In 1731, Pope Clement XII still further extended it by permitting the indulgence stations to all churches, provided that they were erected by a Franciscan father with the sanction of the bishop. At the same time, he definitely fixed the number of stations at 14. So when you go into a Catholic church today, they don't have to be put up by a Franciscan. Many times Franciscans are asked to bless the stations uh, out of respect for what happened in tradition. But stations of the cross should be erected in our churches so that we can walk this way of the Lord's passion not only to receive the indulgence, but to grow in our uh, sense of contrition, sorrow for our sins, and that we can imitate the Lord who forgave us of everything, that we can then forgive our brother from our heart.